being the season of the year that it is, I thought we would take uh, one more, excuse the phrase, shot at Christmas uh, by way of uh, learning just what it is all about. Uh, we believe that most people who celebrate this so-called holiday, which is simply a, um, a form of the word holy day, or the two words holy day, are totally ignorant of what the true meaning of Christmas is all about. Now, having grown up in a certain church and around people, a lot of times these religious people will say, well, let's get back to the true meaning of Christmas. And after I got saved and studied the Bible, I found out that they didn't know what the true meaning of Christmas was. They just simply said a few words uh, to uh, say, well, look, this is all the uh, trimmings and the trappings of Christmas, but we better get back to the true meaning of, of, of Christmas. And they did not know. Most of them who said that were not even saved. They could not know the true meaning of Christmas. Now, what they were referring to is simply giving unselfishly. And so if we give unselfishly, that's the true meaning of Christmas. Well, that's the basis. God so loved the world that he gave, and that's true. But there is so much more, they couldn't even comprehend it. The God-given significance of Christmas is never even considered. Even those who speak of the true meaning of Christmas still allow for what? Santa Claus. We found that he is a patron saint of children. Children are taught to look to him. Uh, tonight, by the way, uh, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to uh, deal a little bit. Uh, Miss Margaret uh, spoke uh, to a subject that we're going to deal just a little bit about. Now, it is hypocritical to take uh, children off of Beavis and what's his name and teach them about Santa Claus. What's the difference? You're still teaching them incorrectly. If you're going to get rid of Beavis and his pal, then you need to get rid of Santa Claus. I guarantee you that they won't get, I guarantee you the whole Southern Baptist Convention will not get rid of St. Nick. I promise you they won't. And yet, we're all up in arms over Beavis and his friends. And to, what I say is this, I've never had a problem over what my son watched. I said what he watched and he watched it. And parents who say, what am I going to do? My children aren't going to like me. And I want to tell you, so what? So what? It's, it's my TV. It's not yours. You're allowed to watch the things that I, you see? And the same thing in school. The minute we took, we took punitive measures from our teachers and principals. The, the dress code went down. The standards went down. Kids, uh, kids talking back to their teachers, stalking their teachers, hating their teachers, threatening their teachers. Nonsense. Put a little bit of wood back there just like my teachers did to me. It, it stopped me real quick. It gave me some, I know of some men, Jack Hank and, and uh, Mr. Dankovich, who with just about two or three whacks would solve all of the world's problems real early. And uh, we're, we're ridiculous to let little, excuse the phrase, brats rule our world. Now, you want to take away Beavis, you better take away Santa Claus. But they, they just want to face just certain issues rather than the whole realm of doctrine. It's interesting, too, that most people think of reindeer when they think of Christmas. In the spring of the year, it's egg-laying rabbits. In the winter of the year, it's flying reindeer. Most people think of Christmas and they think of toys. We just have to get kids toys. And uh, I, there were, there were 4,000 years before Christ is even born. Wonder what kids did before that time. They must have been bored. Yeah. Most people think that Christmas is about children. We have associated it because Roman Catholicism has done that for us because of their connection with Saturnalia and the festivities around December 25th and the mythology and paganology that they've brought in with us. To most people, it's a cozy feeling. Now, before somebody has says, well, Pastor, you've gone from teaching to preaching and you're stepping on my toes, I would never rob you of a warm family feeling. But, but my contention is this, why wait till Christmas? <laughs> 
If you don't have a warm family feeling at 11 other months of the year, why be hypocritical about it around Christmas? You should have strong family ties every single day of the year. And that's where we're failing. But we, we get in the, quote, mood for Christmas. Have you ever said that? Have you ever had somebody say that to you? Well, I've gotten in the Christmas spirit. I've gotten in the swing of things. For a believer in Jesus Christ who's filled with the Spirit all, all the time, he is always in the, quote, Christmas spirit. And uh, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. We could go on. But uh, time will not permit, so we must get a few points regarding Christmas. The first thing that's a little known fact little understood, and I guarantee you, unemphasized in our present-day world, is that Christmas is a predominantly Israeli national event. Nowhere in the Bible is Christmas ever called a holy day for Christians or for the people to whom it was really given, Israel. Now, they did have holy days, but I challenge you, here's the book. If you look through it and find one instance where God said, you make, you make my son's birthday a holy day, uh, I'll buy you dinner. How about that? One instance where he says, make it an official national holy day, or a global one for that matter. Well, you say, Pastor, why bring this out? We just signed a, a peace accord, the United States of America being a mediator between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Army. Do you know what our president doesn't believe? He doesn't believe in the real meaning of Christmas. The PLO do not own that land. And to capitulate land for peace is not to believe in the meaning of Christmas. Because Christmas is a predominantly Israeli national event. Now, in the case of having a, a patriotic significance, that's fine for Israel. And that's basically what America's holy days should be, centered around patriotism and other events as that. We are not a Christian nation. To have Thanksgiving and Christmas on a national level when most of our citizenry, <laughs> are, they're either Mormons or Buddhists or Hindus or Mohammedans and so forth, and most of the Christians aren't really Christians just in name only, to make a national holiday when most of them don't even claim Christ as Savior is to force people into a hypocritical mode. Oh, we, we love these things. We force them to be hypocrites. Now, our president said, well, let's make peace. The problem is there is no peace until Jesus Christ rules this planet. Do you suppose Yasser Arafat would fall down on his knees right now, lead all his Arab Mohammedan friends and say, let's claim the Jewish king as our king and bring him back to earth to rule us? I'll tell you what, if you think that he'll do that, um, I've got some, as they say, oceanfront property in Arizona to sell you. I don't listen to country music, I happened to hear it one time. That's how gullible you are. This birthday is significant because it's preparing the way for Israel and their eternal kingdom on this earth. Verse number 6 of Isaiah 9. No. For unto us. Ask yourself a question. Who is the us there? This is Isaiah the kingdom prophet. No other prophet in the whole Bible addresses the subject of the kingdom like Isaiah does. So in order to have a kingdom, you have to have a what? A king. So naturally, you would expect him to put in a few verses here with regard to the coming king who's going to rule this kingdom. And Isaiah is a Jew. The kingdom is Jewish based on the covenants of Abraham and David. So what does he say? Unto us. Who? Israel. A child is born. Unto us. Who? Israel. A son is given. And by the way, this is a, a reference to his humanity. And this is a reference to his deity. We'll see that in just a little bit because in chapter 7, he addresses it. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which is what? God with us. Now, that's chapter 7, but uh, 
I, I wanted to get this point in first before we go back to chapter 7, but he already said it. That's why he could come to chapter 9 and say, unto us a child is born, humanity, unto us a son, God the Son from all eternity, is given. Now, what's the significance of Christmas? He states it for us. And the government of Israel, and then of course of the world, shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. God the Father himself in his enthusiasm for Jesus Christ, his people, the Abrahamic covenant and, and victory in the angelic conflict. He is the one behind the push of, of seeing that this kingdom comes on earth. Now, as long as people, the majority of people reject Christ as king, their savior and Lord, there's never going to be peace on earth. It's a pipe dream. And everybody who sends cards, peace on earth, they're hypocrites. Because there is no peace as long as there is no peace between them and God. It is simply uh, a, a concept of the devil to bring in peace upon this planet and leave God out. We've studied that before. Now I want you to see the throne of David. Come back with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Now therefore, so shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest. I've cut off your enemies out of your sight. I've made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint you a place for my people Israel. That's the land of Canaan, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. I will plant them there, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. You don't make peace treaties with the Arabs just to say, like the liberals think, we're going to bring peace on earth, peace in our time. There is no peace. We made a tremendous mistake. We are not giving peace. Christmas, its true significance. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to have a place as the son of David to rule. And it's all the land of Palestine and he takes it from the Arabs. Let's look. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them anymore as before time, the Arabs and others. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from thine enemies, also the Lord tells thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy vows. He shall, verse 13, build a house for my name's sake, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse number 16, thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Turn with me now to the book of Luke, chapter 1. The book of Luke, chapter 1. And verse number 26. Here's the Christmas connection with our first point. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, to, uh, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Verse number 31. You'll call his name, uh, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He'll be great, called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there shall be no 
end. Now, why did we read those verses? Because those ver verses take us right back to Isaiah, and Isaiah takes us right back to the Davidic covenant. Christmas is predominantly an Israeli national event. It's the first step in a series of steps taking them to their kingdom on earth. All right? Let's look then at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Point number two. Christ's genealogies prove that Christmas is primarily for Israel. Now, we needn't read all of the genealogies here. I take us just a little time. And... Uh, especially by way of, of commenting on all of them. This is the so-called line of Christ, royal. The human line of Christ, taking him all the way back to Adam, is found in Luke. But Luke deals with Jesus Christ as a human being. And so, therefore, to associate him with the human race, Luke takes his genealogy all the way back to Adam. Though he was never generated from Adam, Eve came from Adam, and so that Jesus Christ could be born of a woman, born without a sin nature, and be uh, like Adam was created, be born as Adam was created. But Matthew deals with him as king of the Jews. What do you have to do in order to have a, um, a qualifications for a king? You have to have genealogies. And so therefore, verse number one of Matthew, dealing with him as king, says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse number 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David and so forth in dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, verse number 16, last part of the, uh, of the verse, of whom was born Jesus who is called Christ. So, what do we do? The genealogies in Matthew prove to us that Christmas is primarily for Israel. Jesus Christ is the one who is spoken of as being born. Takes us right back to David. Implication, importance, significance. David, as we just read, was given a covenant that one of his seed, which would priest, uh, or succeed him after his death, would establish his throne and house and kingdom forever. It's known as the Davidic covenant, and the house is simply a dynasty. Jesus Christ is a member of the dynasty of David. These genealogies prove that. And therefore, if we're going to have the true significance of Christmas, then we need to put Jesus Christ in Jerusalem on his throne, and we all, in um, the time that we live, need to bow down in allegiance to him as our king. But then, of course, from David, it traces his genealogy all the way back to Abraham. Significance. Abraham was also given a covenant, which is a basis for all the blessings of Israel. Christ was a child of Abraham. He is a Jew. And these genealogies prove that Christmas is primarily for Israel. Okay, point number three. Let's turn back to the book of Exodus 19. Now, with this one, I'm going to uh, give something that many of you may uh, not have heard before unless you were here last Christmas when I talked about Christmas and Holy Days for members of the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace. I again challenge you to show me where 
the Apostle Paul ever sanctioned a holy day. Now again, before I push your uh, hissy fit button and you just there saying, well, what do you expect? Everybody else is doing it. Now that's true. Uh, I would not rob you of, of Easter and Christmas. But you better not make them holy days because the minute that you do, you're contradicting the Word of God. Christmas, to me, is just like any other day of life. So is Easter. Bible doctrine, the whole realm of doctrine, should be the focus of the Christian during the dispensation of grace. We are his royalty. We are the body of Christ in this dispensation, living on the earth, and we need to walk and talk as he. But the point is that we're making here one of the little known facts I bet, you, I bet you David Letterman wouldn't have these as his top ten list. And you've ever stayed up and watched his infamous top ten list of, of the ten things, you know, what I'm talking about, most of you. Uh, these things probably would not, would not make his list, but they are in the Bible. The timing of Christmas and the dispensation of grace proves that Christmas is for Israel. Now, let's take you to the ratification of the Mosaic Covenant. The reason that I do that is because the Mosaic Covenant talks about the law or institutes the dispensation of law. Now, therefore, verse 5, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall ye, Israel, be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Then shall ye be a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. They ratified the covenant, verse 8, last part. Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord. They said, we'll do it. So, from 1491 B.C., Israel entered into a covenant and a dispensation was started, calling it the law. When Jesus Christ was born in 0 A.D., April 1st, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, he was born under the law. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come. Now the fullness of time deals with exactly 4,000 years from the creation of Adam to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the fullness of time. But the point that we're making here is that Jesus Christ was born under a specific dispensation with specific regulations. He, as a Jew, born under law, had to do certain things. For example, as a, an eight-day-old child, he had to be circumcised, and he was. He had to go to the temple in Jerusalem. He had to keep Israel's feast days. He had to keep the Mosaic law perfectly, and he did. He was born, it says again, verse 4, made of a woman, made under the law. Jesus Christ was not born in the dispensation of grace. You were, but you're a Gentile. He was born here, and if you'll go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse number 23. At age 30, it's actually 20, 29 A.D. From this point to this point, Jesus Christ was 30 years of age, April the 1st, 29 A.D. Now, you say, Pastor, how do you get that? You count the zero as one year. 
So if you count the zero as one year and you add 29 more to that, that makes him 30 years of age. He then had uh, three years of, uh, of, labor and at the, uh, of, of labor and ministry to Israel, and at the first part of 33 A.D., wasn't the whole year fulfilled, it was the first part. Uh, on April the 14th, he died on the cross, verse 23. Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. Now the point that we're making here is that not only was he born under the law, he lived under the law, and he died under the law. The dispensation of grace did not start until 34 A.D. with the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. It will not end until the rapture of the church and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ in the clouds of the air to catch up his body. Then and only then will the dispensation of law resume with the tribulation period and then the thousand-year kingdom. Well, what's the point? Turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. The book of Colossians, chapter 2. During the dispensation of grace, there are no holy days. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16. Let no man therefore, and he's addressing believers in the dispensation of grace, between one glorious appearing to the other glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days. Why? They're a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. We live in the, in the dispensation where the word of God is completed. We have virtual or ultimate reality. We don't need to have these things to remind us of Christ. It's a different dispensation where God is sending grace to Gentiles with whom he has never had a covenant. So therefore, you cannot have a national or a global holy day. It, it flies against the face of the very covenants of Israel. You cannot force holy days on people who are unholy. And that's why Paul says, in the dispensation of grace, we don't have them. Don't let anybody judge you with regard to them. Why? Because if we make Christmas a holy day, we go right back where? Under the law. And you're not under law, but you're under grace. Now, that's a little known fact about Christmas that I think that we need to know and understand. I'm not saying don't ha have Christmas. It's too late. It's, it's foisted upon us. We will never correct it. In fact, I don't want to correct it. And that's uh, what I'll say to tonight about the uh, Beavis and, what's his name? What somebody else does with their television set is none of my business. What I do with my television set is none of their business. If I want to control it to glorify Jesus Christ, they're not going to legislate against it. Here our president with his liberal ideas of uh, uh, we, we'll eventually get rid of, of guns, uh, handguns, I guarantee you the next thing along the line is that he's going to get rid of all guns of the citizenry. I guarantee he's going to do that. You say, well, pastor, aren't we having a peace dividend and bringing in world peace? Uh-uh. The liberals know that without, without guns in the hands of the citizens, then they can control them without any reprisal and so forth. They'll have the guns. We'll have to toe the line. And our, if we want to go back to the founding fathers, I guarantee you, in the Constitution, Congress shall not write, uh, have, uh, enact any law we, uh, against, uh, and the thing flew right out of my mind there, but against the individual private ownership of guns in their citizenry. And I guarantee you, if we, if we want to have a reprisal in the United States of America, just take away my right to teach the Word of God and to control my own television set, to control my own money, and so forth. Now, those are things worth fighting for. But um, again, 
We're just we're succumbing step by step, slowly but surely. Uh, we are succumbing to the liberal notion that if you take away all handguns from the citizens, you're going to have a safe society. Did you ever ask yourself what happened to Abel? They didn't have a gun back there. He he gave his brother the right offering to be to be saved. And Cain turned right around it with a very sacrificial knife on the side of Abel, took it from his side and slit his throat, just like his, his sacrifice. It wasn't, it wasn't the instrument that killed Abel. It was the fomenting jealousy in the uncontrolled heart of a man without God and who didn't want God. Now you start controlling the inside of men and you don't have to worry about guns. Guns will be controlled. When you start taking them away from the hands of responsible men, you're in trouble. And we're in trouble in the United States of America. Hillary and her Hellcats are most definitely uh, coming down on us. And I guarantee you, most of them do hide their brooms in the closet. Okay. Point three. The timing of this of Christmas and the dispensation of grace proves that Christmas is basically for Israel. He was born under the law as the king of the Jews. He kept the law. We're not under law, but under grace. And we don't go back and not only do we not keep Pentecost, not only do we not keep Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not only do we not keep the National Day of Atonement, we don't keep Israel's, uh, uh, the, the king of Israel's birthday as a holy day. Let me tell you what, the Day of Atonement is much more important than the birthday of, of Jesus Christ, as far as, as Israel is concerned. Now, please don't say, uh, don't, don't misunderstand. Yes, he's the antitype of that. He had to come, but his birthday is not emphasized. His life and death and resurrection and ascension and being seated at the right hand of the Father, that is what's emphasized in the Bible. Okay, well... Um, I meant to cover five of these in the Sunday school class and five of them in the after service. And I've gone to preaching just a little bit, but that's, that's okay, we need it.